Hi everyone, here is Giacomo Bertazzoli from Italy and I'm gonna show you my project on the impact of artifact removal methods on the TMS EG signal. So concurrent TMS EG is a combination of transcranial mag magnetic stimulation and electroencephalography. And it allows to stimulate a small area of the cortex using the TMS and to record how the signal spreads through the cortex with the EEG. Here's a example of an experimental setting of a TMS EEG experiment. And what you usually get from a TMS EEG experiment is called a TMS evoked potential, a TEP, which is conceptually equivalent to an ERP, uh, but, uh, but here the event, the uh, evoking event, the stimulus, is a TMS pulse, is a direct stimulation of the cortex. This technique is, is used uh, to investigate brain connectivity since you can stimulate one area and record uh, how the signal spread to the connected areas with the EEG. So you can make an inferences on which area is connected uh, to, the one you, um, to the one you stimulated. And uh, this is used in basic research to, to study brain connectivity, but can be also used in clinical research to develop new uh, biomarker for uh, integrity of brain connection and also to probe the reactivity of the cortex. However, raw TMS EG signal is very noisy. This is due to the fact that the TMS pulse interact with the sensible EEG recording, uh, causing uh, TMS evoked artifacts that you can see, for example, in this raw TMS, TMS EG signal. Um, you can see, for example, that around zero, there is this huge uh, TMS evoked artifact, which is the, the pulse artifact, which, act which actually goes up to some millivolts. And also later, the decay artifacts, uh, muscular artifacts, the uh, TMS uh, ocular, evoked TMS evoked ocular artifacts, and all other artifacts that impair the use of the raw TMS EG signal. Uh, for this reason, there were, uh, there were developed a lot of offline uh, removal methods to extract from these raw TMS EG signal the useful TPs that in the end look like this nice signal here. Uh, which is, as you can see from, for example, from the scale, very different from what we saw before. So this is an uh, important and heavy phase of TMS EEG signal processing. The point is that, that there are several methods to do this, but there is no standard uh, method. Um, so we ask the question, how the choice of the preprocessing method is affecting the final outcome, which, which can be translated in to what extent the choice of a researcher to use one method instead of another one will affect in the end uh, the, the results. Or is, it, can also, it can also be seen as how safely can we compare the results from two different TMS CG studies that use different uh, TMS CG uh, processing method. So how do we check it? So we took a, a larger TMS CG dataset from a study that uh, wanted to investigate brain connectivity using TMS EEG in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex area and in the uh, inferior parietal lobule. And we process it with four different uh, processing methods. First one is ARTIST, with a, with, which is an automatic algorithm that inputs the uh, raw TMS EEG data and output the clean, the clean uh, TMS EEG data. Second, second one is TMS EEG, which is fully manual graphical user inter interface that guides the, research, guides the researcher uh, through the processing. Uh, third one is TISA, which is actually a um, set of function that uh, a researcher can use to build a, uh, to build a processing pipeline. We use the default pipeline that I suggested. And lastly, sound SSSPC, which as opposed to the other one, it doesn't use any uh, blind source separation algorithm but it used sound and SSPC, which, has, which are a uh, new sophisticated algorithm that allow to clean the TMS EG signal without any ICA. And here the, T, the resulting TEPs, for example, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the, for the four, so we had four outputs since we had four uh, processing methods. Here for the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and here for the, inferior parietal level. Then to test our hypothesis, we just compared these four TEPs 
to look at difference, differences and how the signal correlated with each other. So here, so the results. I'm going to show you the result just for the uh, inferior parietal lobule uh, for time reason, but also because the results in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are very similar. So here are the four outputs. And the first thing you wanted to check uh, were differences in the, in the amplitude of the signal. So we looked at uh, point by point, channel by channel differences using the cluster-based analysis, analysis in the field trip. And here are the results. Uh, here in the row, you can see the comparison, each comparison. There were six comparisons since we had four conditions. In each column, uh, you can see different interval in times of the wall epoch we had. In the last column, you see the wall epoch, and each one of that and of that butterfly plot represent the differences in the TBs. The colored line on the bottom on the butterfly plot here represent positive and negative significant cluster from the cluster-based analysis. On the topographical plot, you see colored the voltage dis distribution, which is the difference of the two condition, and the white dots represent significant channels, so channel in which we found a significant difference in amplitude. The first thing you can see is that you can spot differences, significant differences, in the wall epoch, especially in these four first three comparisons, which were all the comparisons with artist, by, artist method. You can see differences also in the other comparison, but less prominent. So second, the second thing we wanted to check is how these signals correlated with each other. And we, the correlation can be seen both in temporal dimension and in spatial dimension. So we started with a spatial dimension and we look at the topographical correlation. What does it mean? So we had the four, our four uh, signals and we compared each instant, which is a topography of the signal, and we checked if um, we checked how these topography topographies correlated with each other. So it's the topographical correlation. And here are the results. So each colored line here represents uh, one comparison, one correlation. On the y-axis, you can see the amount of correlation, and on, on the x-axis, you can see the time. Uh, these straight lines here represent uh, the significant instant in time in which the correlation, so in which the topographical correlation was significant. And the first thing you can see is that uh, the topographical correlation was significant basically in every instant in time, except from the beginning of the signal. And also you can see that at the beginning of the signal, the amount of, co of correlation is uh, low, while it gets better while in later latencies, but not for all the comparisons. You can notice that for the comparison with artists, with this method artist, they remain low uh, until almost 100 milliseconds. Second correlation we checked was the uh, temporal correlation. So instead of looking at the correlation of the topographies, we look at the correlation of uh, each channel, uh, of each channel in the wall epoch. So for example, this black channel in all conditions. And we looked how the correlation, how the signal correlated in time. And here's the result. In the first column, you see the correlation of each channel for the whole epoch. Again, the white dots represent significant channel and color coded is the amount of correlation. First thing you notice is that all channel are, basically all channel are significant and also that the correlation for the whole epoch is high basically everywhere. But if we split the correlation in smaller window, we notice that in the initial, um, in the early latencies, there are areas in which the correlation is low, which are the frontal areas here, you can see here and here. Um, the conclusion, so. The initial question was how the choice of the preprocessing method is affecting, is affecting the final outcome. And the answer is not straightforward, of course. Um, different methods showed different level of agreement. We see the amplitude that some methods like artist showed a lot of differences while other agreed more, for example, TMSCG and sound. We saw in the, the spatial patterns, like, uh, like we saw the correlation in topographies was low in the beginning and it, and it was variable 
uh, in later latencies. And also for temporal patterns that we saw in the uh, temporal correlations, we saw that for the old epoch, the correlation was very high, but for initial latencies, uh, the correlation was low, especially in the frontal areas. So the choice of the processing method impacts the final TPs. But the real question is, what is the amount of um, variability that we accept, accept in this phase of the preprocessing? And also where all this variability comes from? Different metho me methods uses different strategies and also different uh, level of automatism. And in the end, uh, it sum up in a different uh, amount of data removed with the respect of, uh, of the raw data. For example, if you look at the, uh, at the rank of each um, data set after being cleaned with, uh, with different processing methods, we notice that the rank, which is an estimation on, of how many um, channels were interpolated, how many ICA components were removed, we see that artist removes a lot of, uh, interpolates a lot of channels, remove a lot of ICA components compared to the others. While, for example, TMSEG is more conservative, conservative and it spares most of the signal. So this can be one place where to uh, find an explanation of all this variability. But the, the main question that remains is, do we need a standard for the processing method or do we accept, accept all this variability that remains? So I hope I can discuss uh, this question with you in the Zoom discussion room after the talk. So see you there. Goodbye.